can you see, um, see my screen? Yeah, it's fine, thanks. Okay. Okay, so um, these slides are sort of an updated version of a um, talk I gave, I think, two weeks ago for um, some people who are less experts. I'm going to just sort of skip through some of these um, first slides. I managed to put a meerkat in. <laughs> um, Okay, so you all know, um, you know, that this is sort of the mantra of um, intensity mapping. So I won't go over um, this, but in terms of uh, looking at an off-axis telescope, we sort of thought that the, um, uh, the, the hardest thing in terms of antenna requirements was for the intensity mapping so that we would just look at this as a design um, criterion or focus on this, focus on the hardest thing that you can really um, do. And let's see. Um, okay, so we want to sort of look at our ability to um, recover the baryon acoustic oscillations, and then that sort of um, translates into cosmology and all of that, and that's well known. Um, so uh, there, there are sort of two roots. One could be, you know, end-to-end -end simulation. So you have these designs and then you you make a, a pipeline and then you have to make all sorts of other assumptions about the instrument. And unless those, those are parts of the design that you're sure of it, um, you know, you get a final number at the end. It's kind of slow. Um, uh, and but that would be the sort of, op, might be the optimal optimization. But um, it's sort of nice to sort of um, find some sort of imperfect, simple uh, criteria to um, evaluate um, uh, on antenna designs. Um, so that's sort of what we um, try to, to do here. And um, basically, you have um, the galaxy, um, and the galaxy has this, uh, you know, power spectrum that sort of factorizes and um, a part that's sort of the angular part, um, k perp and k parallel. So here we're just going to sort of look around the um, main beam. Um, we might try to do um, side lobes a bit later, and side lobes are, you, you know, really far side lobes that see the ground, and the other antennas are a, a big problem. Um, and I mean, with the other antennas, that depends on whether you're pointing at the zenith or where you're pointing and the ground is neither perfectly absorbing nor perfectly reflecting. Um, and uh, water is important. Um, so if the ground is wet, it'll behave differently from if the ground is dry, et cetera. Um, I had a long discussion with someone from Schlumberger about the dielectric constant of the ground. So for people who do oil, searching for oil, they use the dielectric uh, properties of the ground as sort of a diagnostic. So we all, we, we're just, as Carla um, pointed out, we flatten the sky, we appetize away the far side lobes and just focus on sort of the, the near side lobes that are still pointing in the sky. And, um, okay, the extra galactic is the cosmological signal, and then modulo um, 
mm, redshift distortion, which we ignore, uh, at least for this uh, figure of merit, that isn't a problem. Um, so if you have a linear measurement process, then we have sort of equation three, um, where uh, there's some sort of a, a linear transfer function with uh, noise put on it. <coughs> and um, in terms of the antenna pattern, um, it really comes into the uh, matrix M. So we're, we're going to just represent some of this stuff sort of abstractly. And um, unless the matrix M is uh, singular or something like that, I mean, you, you could uh, take the attitude, oh, well, we don't really care about the antenna pattern um, as long as we can measure it. Uh, having a weird antenna pattern isn't really a, a problem. Um, so after a lot of thought, we concluded, well, um, there's going to be uncertainty in the antenna pattern. So there are problems in fabrication. There are also problems with uh, um, simulations. The simulations aren't infinitely accurate. Uh, the materials aren't um, like these uh, perfect electric conductors used in the simulations. Um, so to sort of jump ahead a little, um, it, it, what we think is uh, most important with a good antenna pattern is you don't want to mix modes that are sort of cosmological modes with modes that have a lot of noise you know, from the, the galaxy. Um, uh, because that's really going to screw you up at sort of this leakage. And if we just take the point of view that the um, simulations aren't accurate, we can um, just, um, with appropriately defined off-diagonal elements, say, oh, well, um, suppose we only know this, to, you know, 30% or so, um, uh, how much will we get, um, uh, will our analysis get messed up by having these mixing modes? On the other hand, if there is no mixing uh, between these modes, then, you know, you shouldn't worry that much. So, um, in the flat sky approximation, um, well, noise is going to come in a bit with weighting, uh, but um, we're basically um, interested in, in bias, so where you go over and over the same region. If the beam is wrong, that's going to sort of give you the uh, wrong um, a recovered sky map and in a consistent way. And then um, if you consider it's in um, what well, equation five, you have this sort of small perturbation of this uh, transfer matrix, then you can sort of figure a covariant. So sort of the model is that um, the uncertainty of the beam is uh, you know, zero bias uh, random process. If, it, if you knew it were biased, then you would just correct that. So that's a uh, bit the philosophy. And in this um, sort of first analysis, we're ignoring um, uh, polarization. Um, and that's something we later want to look at and the galaxy um, is polarized and there's a lot more complicated frequency 
dependence with uh, the polarization. So this is a big issue that for the moment we have uh, ignored. So um, this is, um, well, as we all know, there's the, um, uh, you know, M-mode formalism for the drift scan. But just to make things a little more tractable, we're going to um, make an additional assumption that we have these strips and that there's also sort of uh, uh, in sort of infinite density of strips. So you, um, they're very closely spaced. So you can, um, this sort of changes your uh, radio survey to um, something that's a little more like uh, optical astronomy with a, a point spread function. And then we'll see how interferometry um, can be sort of put into this um, formalism. So this idea that we're sort of scanning um, uh, um, also in the um, direction north-south is sort of a, a fiction so that we can do um, a lot of this uh, analytically. And there are, of course, calibration problems that um, might um, be a reason why this isn't the whole story. Okay, um, with uh, interferometry, with these two sort of drift scan in both directions, things really don't change that much. So here we have a visibility with, uh, you know, different baselines. So this is B, is the separation between the two dishes. And this sort of, um, is an equation 10 sort of modulates your primary beam. So B of theta is, is just the primary beam on the sky and it's sort of uh, proportional to the intensity. We would, um, in a treatment with polarization, there would be uh, Stokes uh, indices. So there would be four components to, to be um, and um, here we're uh, assuming that the sky signal is uh, unpolarized, so we can just have a, a scalar beam function. And then um, we uh, get this uh, matrix M, which is basically uh, summing over all these different uh, beams and we get a, a covariance. So um, this is sort of just standard matrix uh, algebra, a little like CMB map making. Um, and this is because of the drift scan and the fiction of a drift scan in the um, transverse direction. So um, we, um, can do uh, a bunch of um, maths and basically um, your primary beam in Fourier space gets uh, shifted by the um, B and, and so you, you have these beams that are centered at different places in, in, in Fourier space. But the um, problem or the error that you're looking at is uh, sort of an equation uh, 19. You have some sort of a, a kernel, which you would like to be a, a delta function, but it's sort of moving uh, stuff around in the, um, uh, in, I mean, be, be, because of the, having the wrong, wrong beam, it's uh, changing k parallel. 
So K perp, the wave number in the sky direction is uh, conserved because of this uh, drift scan approximation. So in M modes, it would be that uh, the um, different M's don't mix. And here it's um, with a further approximation, the L's, ALM's don't, um, um, I, I, I mean, those, those sectors uh, don't mix with each other. It's, it's block diagonal. So we're really worried about sort of fictitious moving around of power in um, K parallel, which is, you know, the um, Fourier transform of the um, frequency direction. Um, so here's some um, formulae uh, for this uh, error in the kernel. So this is the error in the, in the map. And then, I mean, so this is completely mathematics. It doesn't tell you what you, um, uh, how bad it is. So you need some sort of a, a model. So the idea here schematically, and I'll show you some plots that uh, are based on um, uh, sky models that Kavi made, is that we sort of divide the modes into cosmological modes that have high signal to noise, very little galactic contamination, and then dirty modes that are just all, all galaxy. And um, I mean, you, you sort of see that it's the off diagonal elements that you're worried about. So if uh, um, KCC is wrong, well, we're going to get the normalization of the cosmological signal wrong. But, you know, that, 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 that'll just be like a, a bias. That's not that big of a deal. Whereas it's these um, leakage modes that you have to worry about. So um, that's going to come out of the um, primary beam. Um, and we haven't put these uh, together yet. Carla does have Fourier transforms of the beam after all the, uh, the appetization that um, she's explained to you. So here's some uh, plots and um, uh, there, there are sort of three uh, components, the cosmological signal. So this is from the extra galactic uh, power spectrum traced by the H1 emission. Then there is the um, galaxy. So the galaxy doesn't vary uh, much with, uh, uh, I mean, the um, frequency dependence is smooth and that's sort of reflected in the fact that um, this becomes dark very quickly. And this is a log base 10 scale, so going you know, even slightly green means uh, going to, um, uh, I mean, the two, two orders of magnitude is a small change in, in color. The noise on the other hand, I think this is the, because the array layout that Kavi um, assumed, I don't know exactly what it is, but, you know, there's about a factor of three so this is um, that some baselines are better represented than others. And here we have, um, this is a linear scale, the signal to noise. And you see that there's a sort of um, a bright spot where you get a signal to noise per mode of about eight 
or so. And um, what we're really worried about is um, the uh, modes that um, the in the beam that are going to take power from, can you see my cursor? Yep. Oh, okay. So, so here there's a lot of power from the galaxy and you can see that's, you know, the signal to noise to zero. And then if you have modes in the beam that will take that um, over there, uh, then, you know, that's, that's a, a big problem. And um, and I mean this, we haven't done it yet. But the idea is to have um, uh, to to look at different redshift, and we also want to sort of look at where the um, where we want to to measure um, uh, to see the baryon acoustic oscillations. But you can make a figure of merit in this way that um, gives you an idea of what is a, a good beam and what is a not so good beam, at least for, for doing these, um, for doing intensity mapping. So this is just a, a sort of quick and dirty uh, figure of merit if before you would uh, want to um, design something, you would want to do more complete simulations, but if you're sort of optimizing um, the um, uh, off-axis telescope and seeing if it can do better than Hyrax for the same beam size, well, this might be a good way to start. And this is sort of independent of uh, the rest of the system. Maybe not completely, because the noise level um, does does come in, uh, uh, and 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 I mean if uh, modes are too too noisy because of the instrument, then um, they they just don't get counted as as being being important. So you might get different results for for different noise levels for your instrument. So let's see. Well, I think um, maybe I'll just say a little about the last point. I, I think we um, mentioned uh, all of most of the other points. So in terms of electromagnetic simulations um, that uh, these sort of antennas are, are kind of unique because they're not like in Planck, you would, you, you, your optical elements are many, many wavelengths across. So you would use physical optics. It's basically geometric optics plus plus. Um, if we had a tiny uh, sub-wavelength dipole antenna, um, that would also be kind of trivial. But here we have things, structures that are um, sort of in between uh, 10 wavelengths or so. So that means that um, what seems good from a point of view of ray tracing optics will not necessarily be that good. It also, um, um, I mean, I think also intuitively one way of um, seeing why an off axis uh, configuration might be a lot better. And this is sort of a bit hand waving. But you, you, if you think of this can as just like a black spot on the pupil, then you're in the can is pretty big, then that is just dispersing um, and creating its own side lobes as if you had an aperture of, of that si size. So you, you, you get very uh, 
large side lobes from uh, having uh, something that, that blocks the beam. But um, there are other problems. The secondary has to be very big um, because you, you, you can't make it smaller than a wavelength. So um, it doesn't look anything like the optical, you know, ca cast crane or Gregorian telescopes are actually the different configurations are used because um, with optical telescopes, you have a secondary to um, uh, make a wide field of view. That's really the only reason. And here we just have a, a single mode. So this is, this sort of gives you a taste of what we're thinking about and working on. And it would be interesting to hear um, your, your comments and ideas. So thanks a lot <laughs> for your attention. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, does anyone have any questions for Martin? So um, uh, go ahead, Inche. Okay, so I, I have two uh, quickly. So Martin, do you mind to uh, reverse back to the uh, first slide or uh, slides of your equation uh, uh, previously? Uh, this one? Yeah, 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 yeah yes. Um, so, I mean, these, these are all very interesting. So I think my first question is that P gal, um, and P extra galactic. So look like you uh, look like the gal um, that only depends on these two, uh, these, these k perpendicular k parallel absolute value, whereas the extra galactic is only related to the norm of the k vector. And what, what is that? And what is the assumption built into this? Well, um, okay. So for the cosmology, and I were ignoring redshift distortion. Um, uh, it, 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 I mean, this is uh, homogeneity and isotropy that gives you this. So we're, we're sort of putting little boxes uh, out and the flat sky approximation um, to have this formalism, but yeah, basically homogeneity and isotropy. So that is P extra galactic, right? And P gal, why, why P gal only the, the absolute value? Oh, well, um, uh, well, okay, we, we have to do a little of cheating with the galaxy. So um, we, it, 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 I mean, uh, everybody knows the galaxy is bright uh, uh, near the galactic plane and especially toward the galactic center. And um, if you look, um, you know, outside of the disk, disk uh, uh, you know, up and down toward the galactic poles, um, uh, um, the galaxy is a lot less bright, but not completely zero. So um, this is where we're doing some degree of violence. So we would uh, have um, different power spectra for, you know, different um, heights above the, the galactic plane. Um, but um, I think it is sort of a good idea to mathematically uh, to represent the galaxy as uh, approximated as a Gaussian random field. So the k perp would be, I mean, if we take uh, the Planck uh, synchrotron maps, or say we take uh, 30 gigahertz, well, that's supposed to be uh, similar to the CBAS maps and you know, the Haslin maps and all of that. So there is a sort of a, a smoothness and frequency. And 
that's sort of reflected in K parallel. So um, appropriately defined and rescale, there would only be power at K parallel equal to zero. And um, it, the cosmological modes would be if I want to measure a certain K, it's some redshift. Um, if I choose a mode that um, is uh, where that K factor is directed or has a large component along the direction of sight, line of sight, then that would have a very small galactic contribution. Um, so that would be a high signal to noise mode. Whereas if that were small, if it were parallel, uh, then it would sort of get mixed up with the galaxy. Um, I should just say that I think uh, looking at the literature that um, the exact form of the spectrum is, uh, there's not really much data. So a, a lot of the stuff seems to be just guesses, but this is the whole philosophy behind intensity mapping. Okay, and the other uh, uh, quick question is your delta M, I can understand your M is uh, like antenna beam response to your underlying signal. So you convolve that uh, to obtain a D. And then here, equation five is your assumption where you perturb the M. Uh, and, um, and you said the delta M is assumed to be a Gaussian random uh, number, which with mean zero and uh, some variance, which is probably equation six. I wonder, is this assumption true? The, the perturbation of the uh, antenna beam is, is, is a Gaussian random number uh, with mean, because I feel antenna configuration is uh, quite complicated and it has a lot of parameters. And uh, so, you know, it depends on which parameter this really perturb being perturbed. So uh, that, that's something I want to ask, yeah. Well, what else would you do? Um, I, I, I mean, we want to model that it's not completely known. So we, we want there to be some uncertainty. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess this is all perturbative approach, but I wouldn't take I wouldn't take perturbative approach unless I uh, simulate the whole thing and demonstrate it's small. Um, yeah, I no, mean, no, I, 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 I don't deny this approach. I'm just saying perhaps it's better to, uh, uh, to test how, how big is this delta M and what is really statistically this delta M behave. Yeah. How would you measure it? I mean, this is, the, this is sort of one of the, the questions. We could compare different uh, uh, packages, different uh, simulation parameters. We could try to measure it with drones and all of that. I think you're raising some really good points. Um, so that this is something that we and other people should should think about well, well how do you assess these uh, antenna uncertainties? Mm. And this work hasn't been done. <laughs> okay. Uh, Boom, you had a question. Is the same what you wrote on the chat? Yeah, I just have some comments, not really a question. Um, you mentioned that fast side lobe is worrisome, and I agree, because with, with Hera and paper, we found very strong foreground, foreground leakage that contaminate power spectrum when a bright point source appear in the fast side lobe, even though the, the fast side lobe may have very low response. If a bright source show up, it can have strong leakage. So I think that is one of the test cases that should really be done if you want to see if these figure of merit can be applied in real observations. Just my comments and thought on that. Yeah, I think we wanted to think about uh, ground and uh, 
um, reflections off of other antennas and things like that separately. So that this was um, this sort of flat sky approach was sort of um, something that we would uh, concentrate on on first. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but it's a good comment. Thank you. Bill. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely something that's going to be a problem. Okay, is there any other question for uh, Martin or Carlo? Let me just say one thing uh, about the, um, some people um, uh, assume that the ground and uh, is uh, is is a, a sort of perfect black body, and that um, the uh, only thing the ground does is sort of add additional noise into your your detector, sort of loads your your detectors, but that is not. That's half true, <laughs> and I, I think it pretty close to half true. Uh, so this is a, a big problem. But just having said that, um, doesn't really tell you what to to do in terms of analyzing this problem. I'm just thinking, Martin, if the crowd matter less with fiberglass um, dish design, because the fiberglass should block some signal reflecting back from the ground, right? It's, it's not like in the edges case where you, you really just have an antenna sitting on the ground. In that case, yes, the ground and the soil layer all matter. But for these high rack design with fiberglass issues, I'm not sure. Uh, Carla might actually know better on these or the values for sure. But it's, I mean, there's a metallic sheet on it, so it would be diffraction, right? That, that would uh, have stuff go to the ground. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter if you have a metal mesh or metal on fiberglass. Or, that's my understanding. Yeah, for sure. But Martin, you said this is half true. What is the other half? That it goes, gets reflected back up into the sky or wherever. <laughs> so if the ground was a perfect conductor, everything would just reflect up. But because it's absorbing some of the energy, you still have energy loss there. But how much will depend on a, a lot of factors, like what type of ground it is, the moisture content, etc. So it's very hard to model. So we were going to do, um, we haven't done this, but one idea was to do a simulation where you, you just put um, at the level of the ground a perfect conductor sheet. That's very easy to do on these simulations. And then um, thanks to the French military, um, a perfect black body, um, this was, uh, is possible to, you know, be put in your, your simulation. Um, I guess a lot of this antenna stuff is for um, sort of military applications. So there's sort of, um, what was it? In 1984, they developed this, you change Maxwell's equations in your layer um, so that, um, you, you get pretty much um, zero reflection at every frequency and every um, angle of incidence. So if you subtract those two and look at the far field pattern in the sky, for example, you'll see how much your main beam and side lobes in the sky change from the reflections off the ground. So that's something simple you could do, but it's just an order of magnitude estimate of what the ground could do. 